Well, it is webinar time. Love webinar time. It's when we get a chance to spend an hour, we just kind of stop what we're doing and we focus on a key subject that matters most to our members and their companies. And we dig deep and we hope that you come away with some uh, some really terrific takeaways. And uh, today is no different. We are really focusing today on a subject that became hypersensitive, especially since COVID happened. And that's really the inventory, the warehousing, everything dealing with that, the, the back end of the house where it's been such a challenge with all the supply chain issues. So we've got a lot to cover, but I wanna mention before we get started here, that on the right side of your screen, there is an ability to type in a message. If you have a question, please do. We got a ton of questions from you in advance, but anything that comes up, send that question to us. We'll do our best to get to it. And this webinar, as in all of ours, are available on demand when this is all said and done. This one will be there as well. MyHFA.org forward slash webinar. You can find our library there and so many great resources uh, in all different subject matters. So I um, want you to be aware of that. I've got three great guests today. They're gonna really walk us through uh, this subject matter today. And I'm just gonna kind of start out in sort of the order as I see you on my screen right now. We have uh, Andres Capo. He is with Eldorado Furniture. He's their distribution center director. Um, they do a lot of terrific, terrific um, different programs and, and, and aspects of, of how they follow inventory. We're gonna be talking about that. We also have Sandra Shine here. She's a senior product specialist for Storus. That's a software solutions company. And we also have uh, Billy Lindler joining us. Bill is the president of USSI, which is United Steel Storage Incorporated. They are a distribution center design firm. And um, so we have this, as you can see, we have it covered from three different angles here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So the, to the three of you, first of all, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. I always like to, to, to start with sort of a, a general question just to kind of get us warmed up here. And, and Andres, I'll start with you. Can you just talk about how different the mindset is in, in running distribution centers and, and following inventory today than it was March 20 when everything went crazy. Can you give an idea about really what some of those major changes have been? Sure, so uh, first of all, thank you for, for having us. Um, actually, one of the things that, that, I, that I talk about a lot uh, every day to, to my employees here, there are teams, is that we have to change our mentality. It's not necessarily about changing the processes. The processes we can change and we have to adjust to them and we have to adapt to them. I mean, if we take you back about two years ago now, probably everything was going well for everyone. Uh, the economy was doing well, the sales were going well. I mean, there's always issues that you have to take care of. Now, what happened with, with COVID is that if you had a to-do list done and you had it in your somewhere filed away, or you had it somewhere, you, you were gonna get to it at some point. What COVID did to us, it basically made you do it now. It made you do it immediately. You said, get to that to-do list and let's start doing these, making these changes. So that's what we did. Um, and again, I, I go back two years ago and I remember standing in one corner of our, of our distribution center and I was able to look down to the other end of the wall and there was no merchandise. There was nothing. It got to the point where I think our, our lowest in stock uh, level was about 8% that we actually had in our warehouse. So we had to get creative, we had to adapt, and we had to make changes. Uh, what do you do? What do you do when you have a situation like that? Well, uh, basically what kept us going, what kept us running, because in, in our case in, in Florida, we shut down for, for about three months or so, and our stores were not open. So we were able to continue to do deliveries, uh, have our drivers out in the street, we couldn't sell in the store. So obviously, what do you go to? You go to your website. And changes that we wanted to do on our website, uh, we we had to make sure we, we did it quickly. Because now what we did is we added, one of the things we did is we added our, our chat our chatting option. So when we added our chatting option, that gave us so much information on what our customers are looking for that we were able to report a lot of these questions and go back and implement them not only on our website, on our features and benefits page, but we also went ahead and put them in our store. So we learned a lot from our chat because those questions, we never got them in our stores. And since we didn't have it before, uh, we, we didn't really know what was going on. Uh, so basically we had to revamp our website. Uh, we had uh, people working remotely. Uh, we had uh, basically to set up appointments, uh, the option to set up appointments, which is not our retailers do now. So if you want to come in earlier, you want to come in. And we still offer that today, by the way. That's something we still offer today and, and customers still use that. 
So just going for the technical side, that's one of the things that we basically had to adjust. Uh, so, so let me, the, the, you know, you bring up something really inter interesting there, and I, I, we'll unwrap this kind of as we go along in this hour, but um, Billy, I want you to play off of something Andres just mentioned. Um, you know, at the beginning of this whole thing, you're, you're talking about there was like this desert initially of, of, of product flow that stopped. But yet in the last two years, we've gone from, and I'm not talking about the mix of product, but we've gone from companies having a lot less than normal to being maxed out and now just carrying so much. Is, is that maybe for you the biggest, biggest mindset change is, is we've got to have inventory, got to have inventory no matter what it is. And that that's was is really the biggest shift that we've seen in the last two years. Yeah, we we've definitely seen a huge shift there, um, and I think it really comes to um, what we're seeing with customers where your days on hand, hand pre-COVID, um, some customers were targeting depending on their model and their in-stock percentage that they were seeking, but they were somewhere in the 35 to 60 kind of band on average. Um, we're now seeing that push well above 60. Um, we see a lot of retailers who are, um, as you know, Mark, we said that, uh, you know, the, the advantage of a lot of the um, companies in the HFA is that they do have brick and mortar stores. And when they're good operationally, um, they have a, a multi-pronged retail experience to Andrea's point uh, with the website. But, you know, it's no secret that, you know, there's a lot of competition pressure from the likes of Amazon and, and Wayfair. And um, I think I shared with you previously, um, Amazon built 180 million square feet of warehouse last year. Last year. Walmart, over 40 plus years, have about 240 million total. Um, and so... We do see retailers that are changing their distribution model, um, adding on, adding new distribution centers to um, to improve that in stock percentage um, to with the uncertainties of you know supply chain. So um, well, you know, we're, you know, you know a lot. And Billy, it's interesting because we're not just you, you mentioned some big guys, and obviously um, you know Andres El Dorado is a, a you know a, a top 100 company, and Billy works you with work with a lot of top 100s. However. This is something that I'm talking to retailers of all size and even single store operators are trying to find extra yeah. space to lease around the corner because of because of the the need for their inventory. So, so Sandra, my question for you is, is that is that this is clearly not just um, a big guy issue. This is really everybody, it would seem to me, has really been scrambling to find extra space, no matter their size. And I, I imagine you've got to be seeing that from the from the standpoint of of the software solutions that you guys work with. Yeah. Well, first, first of all, thank you for having me, Mark. I'm very excited okay. to be here today. Uh, but yeah, that's a common question that comes quite often from a retailer. So uh, warehouse organization is a huge thing. And I can talk about the subject. There's so many things to talk about, but I'm going to pick one in particular. Um, the structure of your warehouse is uh, it's, it's quite important. How, depending on the size, are you going to be able to set up the aisles, the racks, the bean, how much can you expand? Um, are you going to perhaps look into having some priority areas, especially in today's market? We might have some customers that are not always that happy, right? So they might be exchanging products. Maybe we're going to have a prep area where we're going to say, you know what, this is going to be priority. Anything that's going to be an exchange or needs to put together or need to be inspected, it's going to be priority picking or maybe the best sellers are going to be near the exit where we can easily you know, load in the truck. So okay. as you mentioned earlier, it's different for everyone. Everybody has a different size, but organization, it's the key. Um, you want to make sure you make it very easy for your staff to navigate throughout the warehouse. Well, this is, you know, I'm going to just jump into this because we had so many questions that came in about this. And Andres, I'll kick it to you at the moment because as we're talking about this, and again, it does not matter the size of your store, the size of your back room. When it's about, everybody's talking about maximizing the efficiency of the space and maximizing the space. So you guys, and I love that picture that you told us, you're at the corner of your, of your warehouse. <laughs> you got 8%. But then now all of a sudden things change and you've got this, this flood of merchandise coming in that's available because you want to get what you can. So how have you guys managed to maximize the space you have 
rather than just you know looking for another another warehouse to lease around the corner yeah unfortunately down in south florida it's hard to find different locations and if you find them they're i mean ridiculously yes. priced i mean it's not um so what other options do you have well you, you have to stick with what you have because either way even if you find the location it takes time for to get settled in right it might take a couple months a couple years so you got to deal with what you have now um, I was looking at, at some numbers this morning, and just to give you an idea of what we're uh, holding on to is, in, in our yard, we have 135 containers just sitting out there to unload, correct? And yet, our, our warehouse is almost 98% full. So how do we deal with that currently, and what are we doing? Well, the, the first simple thing, because sometimes people think, well, what major changes do you make? It's not the major changes. Sometimes it's the minor things that you do. And, and the first thing I would tell anybody, which is what we did, is, you know, take out from your racks, remove from your racks anything that's not furniture, right? Because sometimes we have racks full of stuff that's either for maintenance or it's for uh, the stores or whatever the case it may be. If it's not for furniture, it shouldn't be in there. Uh, what we did is we bought some storage containers and we went ahead and put that out in our yard and, and, we, and we put that stuff in there, making the full use of our racks. Uh, the, the other thing is uh, many years ago when peer units, right? people who still have peer units used to sell a lot. Uh, your racks used to be about 10 feet high or so. Uh, and Billy, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And all of a sudden, you really don't sell that many uh, high items anymore. So what we do, and we started to do, is started to split our racks. Uh, so you got those 10 foot tall racks and you split them into five and now upholstery can go in there and you can fill up the complete space of your volume. I mean, it's simple, small things like that, that is gonna make a huge difference in, in the long run. Now. Another thing you have to do for sure is look at what's uh, selling your slow sellers, right? What's what do you have in your or what are your overstocks, and then move that product out. Um, and, and what you could do is either you can extend your financing plan, you can have special financing plans, you can create a sale, uh, you can talk about it on social media. We have special uh, units that are going to go out, and that'll move your product out, allowing for more space to come in. Obviously, so those are just some of the minor things that you can do and work with. That's that's really interesting because this this situation is spawning in some cases a little different marketing, right? You're 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 well, you want to sell, but you're also you want some space. I got to tell you, those numbers you just threw out, and if, if everybody listening, if that got past you, let me just pause switch for a second to let you know that they have 130 containers sitting waiting to be unloaded, and they're at 98% capacity. Man, if you want to talk about a, a, an example, Billy, of of what, what folks are dealing with. That's that's really a perfect a perfect example of that. So talk a little bit more about this because um, we we got this great insight about cleaning racks. You know, re really the, the the space is changing. We've got uh, Sandra talking about making sure that things are make sense as far as where they are in the in, in in the building. These sound like kind of yeah, duh, top of the head. But yet it's not, it has not been the way that a lot of it's been done because there's been extra space. So talk a little bit more about what are these changes that people can make in the space they've got to make a difference. Yeah, I, I'll echo one from Andreas is that um, it's very, I, I go in multiple warehouses every week of small to large retailers. And two things that I always look for. One is what he said is that you'll find um, showroom decorations, holiday decorations, um, office files, and, and they won't be in the back. They'll be in the premium beachfront real estate in the warehouse right up front. And it's like, get that out of here. You know, that is where your highest movers, to Sandra's point, the stuff that, you know, is sold merchandise. If I have to wait for another item to come in, keep it up close, keep it up front. Um, another little tip that um, that's really simple is, um, you know, in a furniture warehouse and storage, when you're 98% full, you're you're hunting for a place to put stuff. That's not really, when you start hitting that threshold, you become, it's very operationally challenging. But, you know, you're playing Tetris kind of every day and where to put, you know, a headboard versus a mattress versus a, a home accent or a dresser. Um, and so one simple thing you can do is on the rack face, you can put a tape, piece of tape. This is, this is the minimum height of product that I want in this location. And it, and the operator just says it has to be above that, that, that tape. And, the, and it's kind of arbitrary, but you're getting better utilization of the vertical space because you're instructing the operator to not put it, you know, uh, in a 
48 inch opening put a two foot tall something and it's um it's pretty simple but that helps in the playing that tetris game that um that we're doing right now especially when we're full i just i just love i love that here we're here we're looking for all this great technological advancement and you're talking about put a piece of tape i mean that that's brilliant though because visually now your team you know andres's team if they're using something like that can look and they just they just know by sight what they're what they're talking about um so, yeah. so Sandra, let me ask let ask you this then. With all of this um, real attention to the flow and where things are, it would seem to me that inventory tracking right now and management is um, is is pretty critical. So, talk a little bit about about technologically speaking beyond putting tape up. <laughs> what are some of those things? <laughs> what, what are some of those things that, that are making a difference right now? I love that comment from Billy. So uh, because he went so basic, and I'm actually there's so much technology we can talk about right now, but I'm actually going to go back to the basics uh, because that's what really makes a retailer successful. So let's talk about hierarchy. Just the very beginning of classifying your inventory. Believe it or not, that's a huge deal because your inventory needs to be classified from the very beginning. Uh, what inventory, in what category that inventory is going to be, what group, what collection, what vendor, what brand. Why is that important for, to a retailer? Because later on, right, you will be able to, like Andres says, what are my slow movers? You will be able to really drill into which group of inventory are the slow movers. Those are the ones you want to, you know, those maybe do, do a markdown or a discount. Which one are my fast sellers? So you can drill into that information, but a little bit more to it. It translates into at the point of sale, right? You will know, uh, you will be very easily able to search for a product because of that hierarchy. And then one step further to the merchandising team, it will be really easy for them to drill into which group of products do they need to order, you know, how to replenish, how to, uh, you know, just analyze all the merchandise that's moving, forecasting. Hierarchy, I think it will be my first advice on getting started with an ERP system at the on technology, and we can go from there. No, let's let, but let's 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 pause there, man. That's a fabulous point. So, Andres, let's let's j jump in there. Is this something that you guys utilize? Do you how do you classify your inventory, et cetera, and how are you breaking it down so that you know, you know, not just that it's in the building, but where it is, and 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 all that goes with that flow. Sure. So just before I get into it, I just add something to Sandra's and, and Bill's point. And, and Bill's point is another thing that our industry has is, in, in a lot of retailers, what happens is when you when you sell and you allocate merchandise to that sale, it could be that in our industry, for example, you might have a dresser on one customer sales order, but the other nightstands are on another customer sales order. So when you have that, that merchandise is not going to move until the new merchandise comes in and fills in fill those orders. And so what we've done, and possibly a lot of you could do, is automate that to happen. So basically. We, we try and get all those uh, pieces that are in different orders and try and, and basically by seniority place them into one order, meaning you can move that merchandise out faster. And of course, that customer has been waiting for a while is going to get that quicker uh, because it makes no sense for you to have, again, those two nightstands on one order and the dress on the other, and neither one are going to get the merchandise at any time until so, so the new PO comes in. So group them in and try and get it to that customer has been waiting the longest, and that will also move some merchandise um, out of your uh, DC as well. Um, so going back, yes, we do have a WMS system, and to Sandra's point, she's correct. She's absolutely right. Uh, we do, and to Billy's point as well, we do uh, automatic uh, put away. So basically, we measure each piece of product, and it gives us the size, and basically we measure the width, the height, and the length. It gives you the volume of the piece. So we already know what the volume of the racking is, meaning the system can automatically send us to a place where that piece is going to fit based on the length, based on the height, and based on the volume. Meaning you will not spend as much time looking for that product, especially when you're 98% full like we are. And it makes it a lot easier for that operator to go in and go out quickly and get the rest of the product. Um, the same thing for the picking of the product. You want to get the first in, first out. Uh, just because in our industry, again, uh, our, our, our vendors or our, our suppliers, they basically sometimes change some of the product, the tone of color, something like that. So if you get something that just came in today, mixed in with something that came in six months ago, that customer is probably going to see the difference in color. And so you want to make sure you do the first in, first out so that product goes out at the same time. So that's how we work it just with, with, with the incoming and the outgoing, more or less. That's how we do it with our WMS system. And, and I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm loving the fact that we're basing this conversation first and foremost on just some good 
common sense, straightforward, um, you know, concepts here. Just, just really knowing, you know, I mean, knowing the sizes, you know, to Billy's point, making sure that we can, that they can be, you know, stored effectively. I love the fact that you're talking about first in, first out. You wanna, you wanna also make sure that you're not burying some of the new stuff. I mean, that makes that makes total sense. And then with what you know, with what Sandra talked about, you know, talking about that that classification coming in, it just seems to me, and this is going to sound very basic, because because that's the way I approach things. <laughs> but it just seems to me that we're talking about um, really getting back to just some real simplistic. You know, let's just know exactly exactly what's coming in when. I mean, th there's nothing that takes the place of that, Billy. I guess that's true, right? No piece of technology can can totally counteract just really good attention to everything coming in. Yeah, and it's and it's that discipline, right? No matter what size retailer you are, um, you know. So even if you're a smaller, you know, uh, interior design um, uh, retailer. Um, if you're waiting on Mrs. Jones' house to be completed and it's not going to be completed until summer of next year, well, I'm going to probably accumulate her merchandise somewhere in the rear of the of my, you know, my my staging and storage area. Um, and smaller retailers can, you know, get a significant amount of advantage. Um, and and then looking at the whole facility and determining, um, to Sanders' point of uh, the overall organization and the material flow. And um, and I can't say enough about that inventory profile and that's been mentioned. Um, and there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned. No one on this phone call has talked about dollars in the warehouse because the warehouse doesn't care how much it costs. If, if the sofa costs $10,000 or $200, it, it, it lives in the same spot in the warehouse. It's handled the same way. And so having dollars of merchandise isn't all that helpful. That's why Andreas is talking in cubes and that's why they go through every new piece that comes into their facility. They have an area where it goes and they measure it. Um, they measure it in, in box, they measure it out of box, they measure it in the extended form so they know how much space it takes in the showroom. They do an exceptional job of inventory profiling. They even, they even measure the uh, the amount of time to assemble something. Okay, so, so you're, so I just want to make sure that we kind of, you know, kind of uh, put an exclamation point on that. So you're saying, um, because we're dealing with a finite amount of space and efficiencies of space, it's less about the cost of the item, uh, it, more so your your efficiencies and your your ability to, to scale good practices is going to be based on the spatial piece of it, not necessarily the price tag. Is that is that fair? That's, that is definitely fair. I mean, if you have a, a $3,000 chair or a $50 chair, you know, they're, they're roughly the same cube if they're a similar kind of style. But, um, but and it, I mean, the other thing is, is it's a positive if you can go up market in the same amount of retail space, I, I may be able to do more revenue dollars wise with the same amount of retail or warehouse asset. I mean, because I'm going up market, I can, you know, put more dollars through if I start selling more, you know, $2,500 sofas versus $1,200 sofas because they use the same amount of space in the warehouse. Gotcha. Um, Sandra, let me, let me ask you, you, you went very low tech on the first piece of that answer. Uh, can we talk a little bit more though about, are, are there some, some systems people should have in place that, yes. real, that really can, that really can help because you brought into everything into this this spectrum, you talked about POS and everything else. I'm just kind of curious for this particular subject matter. Um, are there a couple of pieces that are no matter whose whose product it is? Are there a couple of pieces that are just really necessary in this? Product? Absolutely. So let's talk a little more technologically here. Let's go into barcoding, right? And let's talk for everyone because I know there's small retailers, medium size, and large retailers listening to us today. But um, barcoding is an amazing tool for the warehousing, and you can implement batch barcoding. Uh, which basically is you're scanning your products as they come in, as you receive them, as you pick them, as you prep them. Um, so as you do a cycle counting, which I'm poss possibly going to talk about that later on. But um, so barcoding, and then later on, you can connect that scanner to your terminal and transfer all that information into your ERP system. Or you can have RF barcoding, which is radio frequency. And it's all wireless. So as you're picking, as you're doing your transfers, as you are navigating through the warehouse and scanning all of those products, 
all that information is in real time going to your ERP system. And uh, why is that so important to, to you, right? It's because as you do this in real time, at the point of sale, your sales team knows that inventory is available. Your merchandising team knows that inventory is here or they might need to order some more to address point a little bit earlier too, right? Uh, it's just having that information at your fingertips. You know exactly what inventory is, is going out the door, what's coming in. And just to add one more benefit point in there is make sure that the technology that you're using allows you to classify the inventory. Um, we talked a little bit about hierarchy in the basic way a little bit earlier, but remember, when inventory come in, regardless if you're doing barcoding or RF barcoding, if I have a piece that's damaged or maybe uh, it's going to be a floor sample or maybe whichever the situation is, you want to be able to easily classify that inventory in the right place so you can be proactive. What is it going to be? Right? Is it going to be inspected? Is it going to be a charge back? Is it going to be so it can be in so many different directions. Make sure the ERP system allows you to classify your inventory once you're scanning it. Yeah, I love, you, you're you're you know you're really beating that drum, and that's really really key. This whole classification um, situation. I, I'm I'm curious about one thing, and this is something that just hit me, and I think this is important for any any of our members. But Andres, is there are you able to really understand how the efficiencies in your distribution center or any base back room, what that translates into, into dollars to the bottom line, whether it's you know from the from that ex, that expense side, can is that possible to do that? Is all of this we're talking about today, this organization, this this better processing of inventory, is there is there a real number there that that is that is impactful to everybody's operating budget? Sure. So, so definitely there is, um, and and you have to be aware of that. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna bite you. Um, in our case, and again, I go back to our example. Um, we have to unload a lot of merchandise. So, when you talk about efficiency, it's okay. How do you unload this merchandise quickly, and how do you get it put inside a rack? Or, and, and, and to Sandra's point, one of the benefits that you get from a WMS system is how do you cross dock it, right? So. What that means is you're basically receiving this product and the system already knows that it's sold. So instead of having to put this merchandise away into the bins, you're gonna go ahead and cross dock it straight to the shipping door. And in our case, we've increased that number uh, almost 30% in the last two years because we cross dock from everywhere. Um, no matter where the merchandise is coming in, if it's coming in through our return logistics part, which is return goods, or if it's coming in through our pickup department, or if it's coming in through receiving, or wherever it's coming in from, Anytime we hit one of these uh, barcodes, if the system identifies that the piece is already in a bin and it's going to come out, it'll go ahead and tell you, go ahead and cross stock it. So what does that save you? It saves you handling from the product. It saves you putting away, having an operator go inside the, the racks and put this away. And it saves you having to bring it back out. So it's yeah. time, it's efficiency, it's space. So yes, definitely to Sandra's point, productivity and numbers are there. And, and you can see them, you can track them uh, just by looking at the efficiency and the productivity that you gain by doing simple things like those. Okay, and Bill, what about from your standpoint too? I mean, this, um, you know, you, you, this is the area that you live and breathe. So, what kind of what kind of savings can can a, a retailer expect from just having a good, efficient plan in their distribution center or their back room? Well, it, you know, it, it it depends on how bad they are. Um, you know, in terms of if you're you're not very a very good operator, there's enormous opportunity. Um, I think you were in the room, Mark, when I asked a large number of retailers, everybody raise your hand because you got in this business because you wanted to run a warehouse and no <laughs> right. one raised their hand. Um, but but those owners, they know who their best salespeople are. They know how much they sold yesterday, this week, last month, last year. And you need to use those same kinds of measures and guidelines for your operational staff. So you need to know that it took three guys an hour and a half to unload 3,000 pieces and uh, I'm sorry, 300 pieces and 3,500 cubes. And those are the language, that's the language that you start communicating with your team where you have a target. So when someone on boards and they come into the receiving process, there's a known performance target for you as an operator, no matter what your size is. I mean, you're tracking performance on your salespeople, you should be tracking performance on the operational staff. 
how many picks how many picks am I doing if I'm if my job is to go and, and retrieve orders um, you know how many picks should I um, uh, get on average per day and it's different for each operator because the layout of the facility is different the size is different travel different distances are different but have some of those you know just measures that you're tracking on a daily basis and present them to the team because it's lovely when you present it to the team because people are naturally competitive if andreas is going faster than me i'm not going to feel very good i'm going to go start trying to unload faster in the truck because my peer is is doing a lot better and uh but literally presenting that some customers actually present that electronically in in the area but if not, want to put it on a whiteboard and just write write it. It can be as simple yeah. as that. No one, offense, one Andrew. My, I'm going low tech. I'm going low tech again. That, that, that's the easy I mean, stuff. one of my favorite one of my favorite adages is, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so this is kind of why I'm I'm bringing this up that you know, you've got to figure out a way to to, to measure the, the processes, not just put them into place, no matter how big or small your 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 back room is. Um, let, let me just throw this one out to, and I'll I'll do like like a toss up here. Whoever wants to jump in first, please do. We had a couple of really good questions because you know when you're talking about limited space and really maximizing space um there's a number of questions here about how to how to handle in this environment uh returns and repair you know goods damaged goods things things of that sort so who wants to kind of jump in on that one how is how is that managed through this this space crunch that we're dealing with yeah i, I can take that one if that's okay with everyone just at least sure, sure. Uh, because... you don't have to ask permission you can go for it <laughs> <laughs> well um so yeah we, usually when when this situation happens it's a couple of things not just at the point of sale but also at the warehouse right um at the warehouse it's always good to have a priority location just for anything that has gone wrong uh, and i'm not just talking about receiving merchandise as damage i'm talking about customer calling with issues, something that needs repair, something that needs to be an exchange or a return. If we're doing the picking of that particular inventory that needs to be exchanged, that might have to be a priority, right? We're gonna make sure that's okay. We don't wanna have another problem with that merchandise. But also, I wanna jump from there also to the person who is actually talking to that upset customer, right? Because of that merchandise. Um, so it's good, it's good that that person also have the right tools. Uh, for example, uh, technology could give you a good report in real time that says, you know what, Sandra, um, for this particular vendor, I have received X number of calls with issues, and these are the issues they're calling about. So that real time data, it's important for me to be able to call the vendor and say, I'm having a problem with this particular dresser. Uh, so just be ahead of the time. Also, the person who is on the phone uh, talking to that upset customer, I like to have the tools that I can tell uh, you know, Andres, if he's my customer, I will say, well, Andres, I, I can get you an exchange for that piece. And it's going to be available in about nine days because, you know, the system is working for me all that lead days from the vendor. So I know what's happening. And also that, or, or maybe I don't have it. And this is why, but just empowering the person who is working with that customer with the right tool to answer the right questions. It's also a big part. It's not just at the warehouse level. Yeah, and it's it's funny what you just said because I I know of a of a retailer that I just had a conversation with recently that is so on top of all their suppliers because if they see a trend of damage coming in they're calling them on it and they're just they're they're changing that right away because again they don't have a lot of a lot of flexibility. Andres, I see you nodding your head. Is that is it, it, a lot of what Sam talked about kind of resonate with you too? Yeah, and I, and I was going to add to Sandra's point. Uh, you know, returns, returns, just nothing. We, none of us want it, right? So, but we need it. It's there. It's, it's, it's you can't get rid of it. Um, but uh, one of the things that we do uh, for return logistics is that we try and find a way to form a, a very good relationship with our vendors. Because a lot of times, uh, they can help us and resolve the, the the return product that we have, whether they're defective or whether whatever the problem may be. And it's an easier way for you to get rid of that product. Now, in the last few years, one of the things that we've changed, and, and I go back to that mentality change, is before we used to handle the product, like Sandra said, put it in a priority place, eventually repair it, but now we accelerate that process. And now everything needs to get repaired. If we can't repair it, in our case, we do have a, a few outlets where we can go ahead and send that to our outlets and try and relieve our, our, our warehouse process with that and send it out there and sell it there. Uh, but yeah, it, it's exactly, I mean, it's, it's something you have to deal with. Uh, it's just the easier way you find 
to deal with it. And, and, and I guess the most effective and productive way, because you don't want to have any of that product just sitting there for a while. And that's another way that you can also empty out your warehouse. A lot of people, what they do is they put the defective products inside their, their, their rackings or their bins, and they keep it there. And at some point, they're going to get it fixed. Well, at some point today needs to be now. Um, so you, it's better to have a staging area, resolve that problem as soon as it gets in back into your warehouse. Don't put it away because it's just like if you don't see it, you don't take care of it, right? So you want to make sure you have that out and you, you, get it, you get it out of the way as soon as you can. It's almost like you're saying, and, and Billy, I'll let you jump in on this. It's almost like I'm hearing, man, you got to just, the rack space is so precious right now that just do everything you can to only have product there that is true inventory that you're going to be supplying your, you know, that you're selling, selling in, in your stores or whatever, but anything else has got to take a backseat to that. Is that, is that a fair way to kind of get your, your, you know, your kind of mindset on this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what Andrea said is a really key point is that um, I'll say it a little bit differently is that if I have demise inventory, and the only place a customer can see it is in the warehouse, they're not going to buy it. It's not for sale. It's going to live there until it gets displayed or merchandised somewhere. And there's many, many customers that that process can really get out of control. If there's one thing that is good for, for COVID, and I know that Andrea's definitely at, at, um, at El Dorado benefited from this, is that a lot of customers during COVID, during the closures, cleared out a lot of that. And when the supply chain problems happened and they didn't have a lot of inventory to sell, there was a lot of incentive to go fix the stuff that was in the rack and make it sellable to have inventory, you know, during those lean times. So sure. that process, um, it, like anything, it just needs to be managed. And then the vendor side of it, um, it's, it's very common to have, you know, the typical 80-20 rule where I got, you know, 20% of my product that's causing 80% of my quality problems. But I need to know what they are, where they are. Um, was and then and this is a big this is one that if you don't have data you can't manage it but there's been a lot of talk during COVID about threshold delivery about you know dropping it at the door and shipping in box versus prepping and blanket wrapping and putting on a trailer and sending it you know and, and walking it at white glove into the customer's home um, but some customers are exploring shipping in the box because some packaging has improved but they know which products and which vendors and they have the data from systems like Sandra provides that can say hey this this product is safe enough to ship in the box so I'm not going to take it out risk it getting damaged while during the course of delivery I'm going to unbox it you know um, at the point of delivery but not all product you can do that with because it's too fragile you know um, it, it's not the packaging is, is not you know good enough but um, the classic one is like white lacquer stuff. It tends to get scratched really easy. So if I can ship it to the customer in the box, then I'm not potentially going to have as much opportunities for scratch. Yes, yeah, it's, it's been it's been handled less. Um, for those of you joining us, by the way, we're yeah. uh, we're, we're talking about um, the distribution center, your back room, um, great processes to to manage that in these very unusual times we've had in the last number of months. We're joined by uh, Andres Capo with El Dorado Furniture, uh, Sandra Shine with Storis and uh, Bill Lindler with USSI. Um, let me ask this, there's been a number of questions we had come in about KPIs. So I'm gonna throw this out here and let you guys jump on this question whoever would like to jump in. So what are the tools and metrics and or metrics that are critical today in managing in managing inventory, and managing the back room? What are the tools and metrics that are critical do you feel? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit on that and, and just to give you an idea of what um, again and I'm going to go post COVID and, and I'm going to and I'm going to come back uh, or pre COVID and post COVID uh, before and, and, and one of the things we did not have is enough information correct on, on what we were shipping out uh, how many pieces I mean we had that information but we didn't have it clear um, what we did after that is we started to clarify a lot of these uh, a lot of these numbers so our KPIs and we said okay we can make changes based on that so we went down to the nitty gritty we said how many how many items are we receiving in a day and what what can we receive in a day? Uh, based on that, we started to adjust our employee levels. We started to adjust our employee, uh, how many employees were or how many team members were in a, in a certain team or in a certain uh, department. So basically, if you have, you need to get the information, all right? So in order for you to be able to make these changes, and if you don't have that, 
is not going to work. For example, uh, we can tell you right now, and I told you how many containers we have out there, but I can tell you how much we have in dollars. I can tell you how much we received in dollars, how much we shipped out in dollars, how much we have uh, different product in dollars, how many pieces we have. So all that information combined into one, it's going to allow you to make better changes and better uh, decisions uh, when you have this information. And we have, we've had, med we've made better changes. And for, for example, one of the things that we didn't know um, and we didn't have a clear view of is how many uh, pieces we can unload in a day, correct? We didn't have a clear view of that. So what we did is we said, okay, we, we know we have X amount of containers out there to unload. Uh, let's switch around the personnel. We can stop our shipping for a little bit and let's start to receive a little bit. Why? Because you're paying penalty charges for all these containers that are sitting out there, right? So you have those numbers. You know exactly what those numbers are. So this switches around a little bit. Our customers won't get affected. So you receive more product in and you stop your deliveries going out. Why? Because you're flexible, you can do it and you have the numbers in order to do it. So yeah, uh, definitely we're, we're a lot, uh, we're seeing things a lot clearer in our case a lot uh, right now because of the uh, information we currently have. So the KPIs definitely you gotta look at in order for you to make these decisions and make these changes. Yeah, I, I'm going to jump right there because I agree with Andres. He, he mentioned about all these things, the data that we need. We need to have the data to look into. So the reality is we really need to have real-time reporting. You should, we should be able at any time look at our inventory files and say, okay, this is how much we have. This is how much are we going to need. So balancing inventory and how much to order based on historical data, based on the turn of that inventory, the sales rate, how much is selling a week, how much am I going to need three weeks from now or 13 weeks from now? So being able to see all that information in real time is quite important because we cannot guess, right, how much inventory is going to need. And then on top of that, you want the technology to also take into consideration um, how long does it take to that merchandise to arrive to your warehouse, especially in today's market, right? So all that should be part of that consideration. And in addition to that, it's always good for the technology that you're using to allow you to set up a variance percent. And what I mean for that is the market does change. So today, everything's great, but maybe the market's not going to be so great, you know, next week. And when I, as a merchandising or my warehousing, I might be ordering a little bit differently. So I want to adjust that variance because maybe it's going to be 10% less than usual. Or maybe I'm going to copy a trend from the year before. So balancing uh, all the merchandising coming into the warehouse, it actually hits very hard to the merchandising people who does make the decision. So we definitely want to empower them with the right tools and real-time inventory reports. Okay. Billy, what would you say about the tools or metrics that are, you think are critical for any anybody, any any company? Yeah. yeah, I mean, an, an, easy, an easy one that anyone can start with, and Andreas mentioned it, it's just pieces. And so I know if I get a shipping notice and have a PO, I know how many, again, in the receiving process, I know that there's 3,000 pieces. And I know that historically it takes two guys an hour and a half to un unload that many pieces. I have a KPA a target, and then I'm tracking when they start, when they stop, and how well they perform. And even some retailers will track that to a um, an incentive bonus. So if I make that target, for a week or for a month or for a quarter, I'm eligible for a, a, a nominal bonus to incent that, um, that kind of behavior. I also might get a demerit towards that bonus if I get associated with a lot of damage because you try to get people moving too fast and you're slamming products around and, and it has a higher potential for damage. So you have to, you have to balance some of those KPIs so that you're not pushing people to go um, beyond uh, and do things that are uh, going to negatively impact quality. Another um, question related to this that came in, and I'm going to, I'm not, I, I think I know what they're, what they're asking here, but I want to throw this out here. The question was, are there, are there new ways, um, different ways to count turns? Um, and the, and the kind of the follow-up to that was, is it, you know, by SKU, location, special orders, et cetera, has the situation changed how, how we look at turns and, and 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 really, because I, I think they're really rooting this in the fact of, of just how uneven the supply has been, and it's and it's not something that is just sort of a blanket number anymore. That it might be more categorizations. Who'd like to like to jump in on that one? Is, is, are, are there different ways to to really to really count terms, or is it still just sort of the same the same kind of um, you know um, math, mathematical equation you're really to, to to try to figure out? Yeah, I, I can just add a little bit to that. Uh, well, there are 
I don't know if we need to be limited on how to look at turns. We should be looking at many factors by store, by skew, by back to their hierarchy, but a group of products, category, a collection. How often are we selling historical data, bills coming in, customers coming in, how much are they buying? So there's so many metrics, you know, to determine that. So I don't think we have to be limited on, you know, uh, of course, if we want to examine one particular SKU, we should have the flexibility to do so. But again, the technology is there. It's just, it's just having it available to us. Andres, what about you all with how do you, uh, how do you manage the, um, the the turns, et cetera? How are you, is it any more complex than it was or is it still just the same sort of equation? Yeah, and I'm gonna to add to what Sandra said. I think technology has helped you uh, do that. I mean, versus the way you used to do it before, but really I, I don't see anything really changing the way you count turns. And I do agree, you can count it in different ways and by skew or by different products or, group or product group. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I, I don't see really has changed much. Uh, technology does make it much simpler to, to count that, yeah. Gotcha. And, and I think that question is really just based on with all these changes, somebody just asking, you know, is, is that changing too? Or is there anything I need to know? Yeah. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, a good one too. This is a question about demand planning. The question was, should, should retailers buy deep or buy wide? I think you know what they're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> who wants to take that jump ball? <laughs> that sounds too, like such an individual decision <laughs> for retailer, right? But, um, yeah. I guess I guess it comes to um, you know your demographics. How much are you selling? Um, I think it's very individual to the retailer. Yeah, I, I think it has to do a lot with also. Uh, I mean, you have, there's a lot of uh, factors you have to include into that, and and one of the ones that we have to really look at nowadays is uh, your freight charges, right? I mean. Free charges are ridiculously priced right now, so you really have to balance out. Well, if that container that I'm purchasing, uh, the cost of the product is equivalent to the freight charge, which it could be, is it worth selling and is the markup going to be enough for you to sell in your store and you're going to gain enough markup? So I think there's a lot of factors, but I think one of them you really have to look at today is what does it cost me to bring that product into, uh, into my store? Sure, because I, I mean, I think it was a natural, um, and I know Bill, you and I've talked about this, but it was it was a natural byproduct of the situation that that everybody went deep instead of wide because of the fact that they had to go with what they could get. Um, are you are you are any of you seeing changes in, in that? Are we seeing the supply chain loosen up enough to where there's much more variety now than there was, rather than just you know focusing in on a couple of uh, on a couple of categories that you know you knew you could get it. We're our customers are still very much challenged. It's it's gotten better, but um, we're still very much challenged in 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 that area. And um, you know, just on the prior question, I think too, it was definitely related to strategy and how if you go deep or wide, it's really how you want to run your business. If you can stomach the demerge charges that El Dorado is is having on containers, well, they have the product to sell, and they're making a business decision, a very informed business decision, on you know if that's the right thing for them to do. It's not a gut feeling of I just want to you know buy product. I mean, they're they're doing it very quantitatively. Andres, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree. And again, I think you have to look at different factors. It's just not uh, uh, one thing. I and mean, you have to look at all the demerge charges, like Billy was saying. You have to look at the cost. You have to look at that. Um, but definitely, uh, there's there is more variety nowadays. I think the the, the the vendors and the suppliers are are opening up a little bit more, and you have uh, more options out there for sure. Again, it's just a matter of fact on what you want to pay to bring that in. I think that's a real big question nowadays. Um, and none of us know if that's going to get any better. I mean, uh, you can do different things. You can go. Uh, in our case, we've had to outsource our, uh, we had to find freight forwards, which we never had to do to uh, bring some of that product in. So how much, it's, it's probably a little more expensive to do that. Uh, but what happens is at least you have the equipment and they have the equipment and the vessel to bring that product in. The other option is not to get it. And then you have a warehouse that you don't have merchandise to sell. So I think, again, there's a lot of factors you have to play into that and you have to be willing to say, okay, do I do this or do I not? You have to balance it out. You know, the, um, there's also a, a little bit of a thread through some of the questions we've had from people that are that are joining us today, um, also related about just manpower. Um, everybody has dealt with labor issues. Um, we know that's not just on the sales side. We know that's also on the, on the back of the house. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? And maybe, Andres, you might be the one to start with that as well. 
Um, you know, has that has that been more of a more of a challenge? And, and are there things you're doing to to retain those important folks in the back room? Yeah, definitely it's a challenge. It still is a challenge nowadays. Um, it's, it's, I, I want to say it's gotten a little bit better, uh, but not to the point where it was um, again pre pre COVID. So. Um, one of the things that we, and, and again, they go back to being creative and changing the way we do things uh, that we decided to do is, in, in our case, we use third party contractors for our deliveries, um, our deliveries out there. We don't, they're not our employees. So we use them kind of a source for recruiting. And we basically did a contract with them and said, hey, if you guys have any of these helpers um, that are off or you know people that we don't, uh, bring them in as a contracted employee and we can do labor for them, any type of labor. So that's worked out pretty well for us. And, and, and those of you who have contract drivers out there, something you might want to think of. And again, it's through a contract. Um, you don't have to pay these employees or, or these contractors. You don't have to pay them any benefits. You just basically pay the company one flat rate, whatever your market going rate is for, for an hourly job. Um, and it's worked out great because these guys have the experience of moving furniture in our end. You're not just getting anybody from the street that doesn't, you have to retrain these people and spend time retraining them. So you're bringing somebody in that really knows how to move the product, they know how to handle it, and they know how the product is. So it's a lot easier for us to, to, to work with them and to bring them in and out. If it's something we don't like, that, that, that contractor, we don't want them, we just switch them out for another one. Um, so that's one of the things that we've done to in order to, and, 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 the, and the distribution center side. Uh, and yes, we've improved our benefits as well. Uh, one of the things we did, which is very highly, uh, I guess, accepted with all employees, we started to do four day weekdays, uh, week or work days. Um, in some areas, you can't do that in Harry because a retail business is seven days, unfortunately. So a lot of people have accepted that. And that's one of the benefits that we've added in order to retain some of our employees. Yes, do you have to pay more? to some employees to stay with you, you do. Um, you have to go out there because there's a lot of competition. You have the local McDonald's or you have the Burger King's or you have they're competing with your salary. So you have to do something different in order for you to retain these employees. So that's one of the things we've done. Um, we we've definitely changed our work hours. For example, uh, in our distribution center, we and I don't, I don't remember before, we, we used to open like at five in the morning, close like at 10 o'clock at night. We'll reduce those hours um to basically half of that and believe it or not we're more efficient and more productive now with the employees that we have so uh in our stores we did the same thing we used to open about 10 hours 11 hours now it's an eight hour work day what does that cause that causes better work life experience for these uh for these employees they don't have to we don't have to get two shifts it saves us money it saves them time so there's they spend more time at home uh they don't have to come in so early or at least so late so definitely those are little small changes that we've done it hasn't affected our business. On the contrary, uh, we've sold more because one of the thoughts that we had is, well, if we close our business, our showrooms a little bit earlier and open them a little bit later, we're going to lose customers. Well, you know, we're not a grocery store. We need to go get milk and eggs uh, that night and you need them for tomorrow. Furniture typically wait for the next day. So we haven't seen a decrease in our sales. Um, definitely on the contrary, we've seen an increase. So that really hasn't affected uh, us in any way. So that's just the small things that we've done to try and retain and keep employees. Because, 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 Bill, you've, I'm sure you've heard it from uh, your, your clients, people you've dealt with too. I mean, you can have the best system in place. If you don't have the uh, good people, um, you're going to be, you're going to be chasing your tail the whole time. Um, is, 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 yeah. You know, are and you it, hearing a lot of the same things? Yeah. And, and I think Andreas brought up a great point is that um, we have one of our uh, customers who share with me, uh, Broad River Retail, they're an actually licensee in the Carolinas. Um, and uh, Manny Rodriguez, their COO, told me that um, to drive to their warehouse, you pass seven other hiring signs with an hourly rate more than he pays. And so how do you keep people in that environment? Well, you have to do some of the unique things that Andreas is talking about where it's not all about money for all people. Maybe I, you know, maybe I would rather make, you know, a quarter or a dollar or less an hour, but I get a four day work week in South Florida and can go fishing three days a week or, um, you know, or uh, just that quality of life. Um, and to Andrea's points of recruiting, taking on very unique approaches to recruiting, the guys and gals that work for you currently probably have friends and family that they know that would be well suited for the job. And so incent them to um, bring you good people. 
um, that, that, that they know and trust because they're kind of sticking their neck out, right? Because now they're making a recommendation for someone who might work with them side by side. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of compensation things that people have done as well. But I, I don't think they saw that move the needle as much as some of the, you know, flexible scheduling, even just guaranteeing that, you know, you're going to have two days off in a row. A lot of retailers, because in the operations, they're operating six, seven days a week, and they have families, and, you know, they don't want to work every Saturday. And they definitely don't want to work Saturday and then, and, and then have Sunday off and then have Wednesday off. And so, you know, and, and, I, and I think a lot of retailers have done what El Dorado have done is they're saying, hey, we're, we're not the ER here. You know, we're not the emergency room. We're not the grocery store. You know, people, um, and right now there's still significant demand for furniture. So, you know, they'll come when you're open. They'll, 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 make, they'll make it work. But, um, but on the D.C. side, um, you know, I've seen a lot of night shifts go away because they just, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't staff them. But uh, that time off thing is a big one that has moved the needle for quite a few retailers. I mean, this is this, this is a great way that we're kind of winding down here. But it's a great way to talk about that because that's a, such a key part of managing all of this. You can have Sandra, we can have the best systems in place. We can have all of this, all of this. But if you don't have good, consistent people to manage that and to and to work with it, um, it's you know you're going to be continuing to just sort of throw money at something where you don't have the manpower to really. Mark, you are, you know, all of you are 100% correct, right? It's all about the people. But at the same time, you do want to empower everybody within your team because if you select the correct, uh, you know, technology for your business, regardless of your size, you want to make sure that inventory management talks to merchandising. You want to make sure the merchandising module works with accounting. Now we're talking about vendor charge back, return to vendors. You want to get those credits back. Um, you want to make sure, you know, if you get short ship, we're paying for the right thing. Um, so uh, maybe text messaging, email into your customers as merchandise comes in. So yes, the people is the number one, but empowering with the right tools to help the customers. I think that's, that's a huge thing right now. You know, I want to um, just mention that we have had more than I can mention, some great, some really great takeaways uh, today, and I, and I would suggest to anybody that's been watching just to share this webinar when you get the chance. But you know, I think the thing that's really interesting is, is that you, you all said the thread through this whole thing is just. Um, oftentimes, I think that in historically the back room has been sort of just where you stored stuff and things went in and out of. What I hear all of you saying is, is the attention to detail there not just space management but but where you're where and how you're moving things to Andres's point about about you know not putting something on a rack if it's just going to be heading out the delivery door all of these things you've all talked about that so i think that um a great comment is just to say if you haven't done it in a while and maybe do it with a great regularity is go into that back room take a look take pardon the pun take inventory of how you're running it and what's what's going on out there make sure that you've got systems that tell you what's there what's coming where it is all of those things those simple questions um i don't know that just seems to me like the, the biggest takeaway for today so i just i, I want to thank the three of you this has been I, I, I you know this hour went like that but i want to thank um, andres capo distribution center uh, director for el dorado furniture down in florida uh, i want to thank sandra shine she's a senior uh, product specialist with storis they're a, a software solutions company and also want to thank uh, bill lindler um, he's the president of united steel storage inc their distribution center a design company. I want to thank the three of you. I want to remind everybody that, as I mentioned, this will be on demand for you at myhfa.org forward slash webinar, as well as all the other subjects that we have dealt with. So for the three of you, thank you for joining us. And everybody else, I always like to wish you good health, good sales. And uh, today, we're just going to add to that is just take a look at the back room. You'll, you'll be glad you did. I'm Mark Schumacher. Thanks from all of us here at thank HFA. You. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you Bill. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.